Also happy Easter weekend and Ramadan Kareem to those celebrating. My name is Tatenda and I'd like to welcome you to the first ever IAS research workshop series. IAS or the International Association of Student Surgical Societies aims to empower and encourage aspiring surgeons from across the globe and help foster a united equitable agenda for the future of surgery. This is through lectures, workshops, networking, and skills development activities. So please make sure to keep up to date with our social media profiles, Telegram group, monthly newsletters, and website to stay up to date with any recurring and future events. With that being said, I'd like to hand over to our moderator today, today Nabeen, who will also be introducing our instructor. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone. I am Asad Rahman Nabeen, uh, part of the research and advocacy team of IAAAS and also the National Delegate for Bangladesh. So today we'll be having with us uh, Dr. Tanvir Haider, who passed his MBBS from Dhaka University and completed his MSc from On Population Health with Distinction from University College of London, UCL. His current position is he's a study physician at ICDDRB. He was previously a research associate in Health 21, epidemiologist in Renata Limited, public health intern in IEDCR, general assistant for the Asia Pacific region within uh, IFMSA, and the supervising council and president for BMSS Bangladesh. So without further ado, let's all welcome Dr. Tanvir Haider for today's session. Um. Hello everyone, thank you Nobin for the introduction and thank you to IAS, IAS for allowing me to take this presentation today. Um, so my session today is getting started with research. Um, let's uh, start, shall we? Um, so today's topics are, um, we'll talk about how to select your supervisor and create your research team. Then we'll talk about how to formulate and finalize a research idea and then proposal development and finalization will come. And in, in the end, we'll talk about how to establish and finalize a timeline. Uh, it will be like roughly around one and a half hours. So bear with me. And if, you, if anyone has any questions, please put your hands up. Or if I'm not looking at the screen, just unmute and ask questions at any point. And I'll be very happy to answer your questions. Um, uh, just, I wanted to clarify something. Um, uh, are you seeing the names and videos or is it just only me? It's just only you, the research cycle. All right, cycle. perfect. All right. So let's talk about the research cycle. Um, at the beginning, uh, we know that research is a cyclical process. Um, so it has to, you have to go through multiple steps and multiple steps of the cycle at the end of which you will be able to uh, get a research, um, uh, some sort of findings out of the research and maybe a publication. So how does it start? First of all, you have to form a team. So you have to form a team, then you have to identify a problem that you want to research about. You have to do literature review. You have to do formal, uh, you have to formulate your research questions, objectives and hypothesis. And after that, you have to be, uh, select an appropriate design for your research. And then you have to collect data and then data processing and analysis of that data. And after that, writing and dissemination of whatever you have found. So this is in brief uh, the various steps of research. Uh, in today's sessions, we, we, in today's session, we'll be covering step one, step two, uh, part of step four. Uh, the other steps will be covered in other sessions uh, which are to be followed. Uh, let's start with the formation of research team. So at the big, uh, in the, if you want to form a research team, you have to begin with three things. First of all, you will have to select a supervisor and then you have to assess the personal requirement for the project that you are doing, like what sort of personnel are required, uh, what are their uh, various roles, for example, if you're doing a quantitative study, you might need a statistician who's very good at statistical analysis, or if you're doing a qualitative study, you might need an anthropologist or someone who can do uh, qualitative interviews. So you need to know what sort of study or research you're doing and assess the personal required for that project and uh, recruit accordingly. And as 
as the same. And the last part is you have to recruit and finalize the study team. And then once the study team is ready, you have to proceed with the idea. Um, it's not a linear process, obviously. With every research, uh, if you have experience with research, you'll know that um, this is um, kind of like simultaneous process. Like, for example, you have to, you can have like, if we go back to the previous slide, someone can have an idea already in mind before even form it, uh, form, forming the research team, even before finding a supervisor. But sometimes you find a supervisor, then you think of an idea and then go ahead. Similarly, you can do something like you have a supervisor, you have even an idea, the two of you discuss and you have decided on what to do. And after that, you recruit and proceed with the study. So it can go in whichever way, whichever direction you want, depending on the situation you are in. Uh, let's talk about uh, qualities of ideal supervisor. And supervisor have to a supervisor has to be effective communicator. For example, um, uh, I I'm not sure um you uh, how many guys how many of you guys have supervisors or if you have for example think of a boss in your previous jobs or someone who has been kind of a leader in your group. For these people, effective communication is very important. Uh, because you need to talk to them very regularly and if they are silent and if they disappear for weeks on end then you'll be in big trouble because without them without their guidance you will not be able to do your research and you will not be able to grow so when selecting a supervisor you have to be very mindful of that that the supervisor you're selecting is very is very uh, open to com communication and then passionate. So passionate, someone can be passionate about anything, but this for this uh, particular slide, we're talking about passionate regarding the subject you are doing your research. For example, there are so many um, um, fields of research out there, even in medical health, there are so many topics, so many subjects. For example, someone can be doing studies in uh, maternal child health. Someone can be doing in neonatal health. Someone can be doing in infectious disease. Someone can be doing climate change. So many different options. So you need to pick someone who's passionate about the topic you are passionate about. So they know, so they are passionate about doing research in, for example, maybe, for example, I am into, I'm doing research into um, maternal child health. So I am currently, working as part of the maternal child health division in ICDRB. So I had to find the department or supervisor who is passionate about the type of research I want to do. So you need to be mindful of that as well. Then uh, comes knowledge. So the supervisor does uh, will have to be knowledgeable as well as passionate. It cannot be one or the other. Uh, they have to have in-depth knowledge on the field so that they can guide you throughout the various steps of research. And then four is supportive of your career. It means that uh, I am, no matter at what level you are, your supervisor has to be supportive of your career so that they can nurture you and help you grow. If they are not supportive, if they don't help you help look after you and help uh, guide you towards the next steps of that research and make you learn different things about research, it will be difficult for you to continue as a researcher. So this is also a very important point. And after that, it comes active. Active meaning the supervisor himself or herself have to be active in the field of research, meaning they are passionate about research, but they're also actively involved in your study, also other studies. They're doing research, they're actively taking part into the uh, research discussions, they're communicating, they're putting their inputs, they're editing, reviewing your ideas, they're helping you design your research studies, formulating research questions. They have to be active in every single part of the way. If a supervisor matches all of five of these criteria, then they're the ideal supervisor. Now, now that you know what the ideal supervisor is, how do you choose one? As I was talking about earlier, align research interest. 
you have to find someone who has similar interest as you. How do you do that? Simple Google search. Maybe in your university, maybe in your faculty, maybe in some other university in your country or even abroad. Do Google search and look up the topic you want to research in or the topic you're interested in and see who are the pioneers in that field who are working and doing research so that your ideas and their ideas are aligned. Seek trusted sources means uh, seek out and uh, today we're living in the age of globalization. We have LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have uh, Google Scholar, Orchid, so many other stuff. You can look up your supervisor and see who has previously worked with them, under them, or with them. And talk to them and see if your supervisor possesses the five qualities that we are talking about previously. It takes two to tango, means you cannot do research by yourself. It has to be a bi-directional communication. You, you put out an idea or you send an email to your supervisor, he or she will reply back with review. Then you build on top of that. So it has to be on both sides. So if you're emailing or calling someone, but you don't receive any reply or you, you don't see, uh, see any interest from them, then you can pretty sure and uh, you can pretty, uh, you can ascertain that they are not interested into that research or interested into doing re research into with you. Trust your gut. Even after talking to others, even after looking at their previous research, research, you have to trust your gut instincts and look into that person, like look into your previous communication with that person and think that yes, this person is the right match for me and I think we can we make a good good team so you have to believe in yourself and in that instinct otherwise you can choose you cannot choose an ideal supervisor then wash rinse repeat what does it mean uh, there's not only one supervisor out there reach out to as many supervisors you think are plausible and possible for you who matches you or matches your profile and then go through the process with all of them until you find the perfect match for you. So this is how you choose an ideal supervisor. Now we'll talk about how to contact with the supervisor. First of all, as I was talking about, we live in an age of uh, information. You can find someone's email from anywhere, but especially for academics, you can go to their university websites and search, search using then the researcher's name, even like maybe do a quick research like uh, uh, Professor X from the uh, University Y. You will see that their university profile will pop up. And in their profile, you will find their email ID. For example, in University College London, the university where I um, did my MSc, they have something called Iris. In Iris profile, Every Iris is a um, kind of like a platform, and every professor, a researcher in that university has to have an Iris profile. And in that profile, they'll have to write about what is their research interest, what sort of research they are doing, and on top of that, they have to um, have their research. Um, they have to have their contact information, like their emails and other things. Then you have collected your. Uh, potential supervisor's contact information. Now you need to start writing that. You need to start planning about the first email. Um, there are several considerations you should make before contacting a potential supervisor. It is important to ca carefully plan both the people you want to co contact and the email you want to send. Huh. So how do you go about planning the first email? Draw up a list of potential supervisors and perform a relevant background reading about each one. Sometimes researchers can have their own website, as I was talking about, but in which you can find more details about their work and research interest. It may also be wise to read some of the latest publications accessible via PubMed or Google Scholar. Not only does this give you a better idea as to their specific 
specialty of work, but it also shows commitment if you do establish contact with them. Then now you are going to write about the first email. Think of the first email to the supervisor as a cover letter. The email should demonstrate why you are a suitable uh, candidate to be part of that team and do research with them. And why the supervisor should take you on as part of their team. The following, <clears throat> so I'm now going to talk about some of the points, just keep in mind. First of all, email etiquette. etiquette. It is very imperative. When you're writing the email, you should follow proper etiquette, like for example, start with dear or mister and end with kind regards, best wishes, sincerely. Also, another very important thing is spelling, grammar errors. You should uh, definitely avoid that. Maybe have your email, uh, email reviewed, have your email reviewed by someone else who's maybe good at English or maybe do a very basic uh, grammarly correction if you have access to grammar. But having grammatical errors in your email are a very big no-no in the academic field. And every supervisor frowns upon it. Then comes the formatting of the email. You should know which for, uh, the font size and a paragraphing should be uni uh, sorry, uniform throughout the email. You should write a clear, concise, and interesting email subject. Otherwise, your mail might just get buried into the heap of emails a supervisor has because these people are very busy. So your subject title should be interesting. Then patience and per perseverance. What does it mean? As I was talking about earlier, these people are very busy. So don't lose hope if you don't hear back from them within the first week, maybe the second week, or even the third week. Do something send an, another email because they might have missed your previous email. And you can send them reminders with a suitable timelines in between. That is very normal and that is acceptable, but never lose hope. Because very on very few occasions, you will receive an email from the supervisor on the very first attempt or very first day. That is very rare. Then keep options open. What does it mean? There are plenty of fish in the sea. As I was saying, create a pool of supervisors that you want to connect to and do background research on them. Make a list and start reaching out to them. Not only on the same subject, as a medical student, I'm pretty sure most of you, or medical graduates, most of you have uh, interest in more than one particular topic. For example, myself, I had, uh, interest in three or four different varying topics before I started uh, my career into research. Then I started going out, going with the flow, like which supervisor responded, where I saw more opportunities and etc. But you should keep your options open and reach out to as many supervisors as you can. Also, but keep in mind, you should have the transparency and tell your su potential supervisors that yes, I am also talking to other supervisors in case uh, just to avoid any sort of misunderstanding. And this is kind of like very acceptable and any good supervisor will appreciate that students are simply expressing interest and in in inquiring with different supervisors. It shows that you have appetite for knowledge and research. Then arrange a meeting. You have emailed your supervisor, they have replied back. Now you want to arrange a meeting and sit with them. It is always not necessary, but you should always be prepared before going into a meeting. For example, read some of the recent publications of your uh, the potential supervisor you are going into meeting with. It shows that you're interested into that field of research. You are also knowledgeable of that research and supervisors like that, you have come prepared. Reread your email thread with the supervisor because you might 
see that su the supervisor had asked you some sort of question in the previous email or that you have answered something. So you should keep your answers uniform and be uniform. Then create a good uh, agenda for the meeting. For example, you are not only interviewing the you are not only being interviewed by the supervisor. You are also interviewing the supervisor because it is also very imperative that you know the supervisor you are going to work with. You are planning to work with, so you are also interviewing them. So keep an agenda. Also ask questions. And most importantly, do not underestimate the importance of a good first impression. Appear well dressed, enthusiastic, motivated, and always smile. Meeting the supervisor. Meeting is a great way to assess your potential supervisor and whether they are the right choice for you. Remember the five, five points I talked about earlier? the characteristics of an ideal supervisor meeting is the best possible way to assess that because through email you can maybe superficially understand one of those qualities but you can actually scope out your supervisor through the meeting you should also look into things like are is the supervisor listening to you are they actually uh, doing bi-direction com communication with you or are they actually interested in you or the topic you're talking about? These will show, these are minor points, but these will show that um, the, uh, the supervisor is passionate about the project that you're talking about. Then maybe ask how much time they're going to put into that project itself. How much, uh, inquire about their availability. If it, if it suits your project and the research you're planning. Then you can even ask them about your career growth, how they will help you grow, how they will help you learn. And after all of this, you can maybe to uh, finalize. And if you like them and if they like you, then you can uh, finally choose one of the supervisors. And that's how uh, you get a supervisor and about the other parts of the uh, for research team that I was talking about uh, I will not be covering them today because uh, for that we need a deeper understanding of the research process which is not possible in this session because we need to talk about the research studies research study design data collection process etc so those are all variable uh, those are all dependent on those topics as those sessions are to be followed i'm pretty sure the moderators and facilitators of those sessions will talk about these and at the end of the all at the end of all of the sessions you'll have a clear idea how to create a proper research team now let's move on to the next topic which is formulating and finalizing the idea so it has three different, you have to go through three different steps. First of all, you have to identify the problem. Then you have to do thorough literature review. And then you have to formulate research questions, objectives, and hypotheses. In today's session, I'm gonna talk about the identification of problem and formulation of research questions and hypotheses. Because if I'm not wrong, you in the following sessions, you will have a, a session on literature review and a session on objectives and study methods and designs. So as not to uh, talk about the same thing multiple times, I'm going to limit myself to those three things. First of all, how do you identify a problem? Hmm. First step is thinking big. Uh, when you're start, starting off with, with an idea, throw your net as deeper and wider as you can. For example, just think I'm into endocrinology research. 
You don't have to uh, narrow down to diabetes. Just think, think big. Then start reading. For a researcher, you have to be an avid reader because we have new data, new research, new studies coming up every single second. You have thought of some idea, go online. There's a huge chance that someone has other, someone else has already thought about it and already put it into action and they have done research on that. So what I will say is that don't be discouraged, start reading, keep reading. It's not possible for everyone to do every research. There are definitely opportunities for you. Now, the next step is, are there any existence, existing evidence into the research you are looking into, into the topic you are looking into? For example, you are looking into something very unique, like for example, human cloning. No one has done anything on that, something like that. But there are also topics that is, for example, lung smoking causes lung cancer. There have been so many things done on that. So read. After that, once you have read through all the available literature, usually uh, it will be discussed during the literature review session. Um, you have done the proper literature review of the last 15, 20 years. You can uh, pretty much say that you are up to date on the current database or on this topic. Then go about finding the gaps in the current research. How can you do that? Just read the research papers. In the, in the, at the end of every research papers or articles, the research team always writes what are the limitations and what, recommended, uh, what recommendations they have for the future researchers or future ac academicians. And you can narrow down your, the current gaps in knowledge from that. And in academia or in research, research, it is very important that you always address gaps. There's no point in replicating and duplicating evidence that has already, already been done because it can be considered, first of all, plagiarism. Also, it's a waste of your time because people has already done it. So there's no need to do it unless you are coming at it from a different angle, from a different approach or from a different setting as well. But you have to address a gap in the current literature and that gap has to be worthwhile. Then identify gaps and narrow down. For example, I was talking about endocrine. For the purpose of this study and the following slides, I'm just going to give you one uh, hypothetical example, which is, for example, uh, you have looked into endocrine patients or endocrine disease, and you've seen diabetic, uh, there's a huge increase in diabetic patients worldwide, and there have been new medications and other various interventions coming on, which are to control diabetic patients, but you have thought of something unique, which has been done for other diseases, but not for diabetes, which is maybe a nut best diet, a macadamia nuts or some sort of other nut best diet, you think that might help you reduce diabetes. So you have identified the gap. No one has done research on this topic. You have narrowed down. Now you can go on to the next step, which is PICO. Uh, once you have identified a Research, question, uh, research idea, you have to formulate a research question. So what is a research question? You have thought of an idea, but you now need to put it down as a question because as researchers, you and we are asking questions that need to be answered. So you need to identify what question that you are asking and what question are you trying to answer through this research, sorry. So there are quite a few methods to formulating a research question. My favorite method is PICO. 
it can be with E or I, depending on the type of research. In with E, you're talking about target population. And the population you are doing research on or the people you think are relevant to your topic, then E or I depends on the type of research. As you already know, there are two types of research, observational and interventional. For observational research, it will be exposure or E. For interventional research, it will be I or intervention. And then we have to talk about comparisons, which is C. Basically, every research you do has to have a comparison group. Not every research, but it is usually best that if a research has a comparison group. And then after that comes the O, the outcomes. What sort of outcome you're expecting or you are envisioning for the research to have? That is the PICO. If you answer this question four points, then you'll be able to write down your research question. So let's move on. For example, as I was talking about, my target population is diabetic patients in town. For example, a, in a town in Bangladesh, which where I am from, we've seen in Bangladesh overall, the diabetic trend is going up. And every day, every year, actually, it's increasing at a significant rate. So we want to do research in regarding this. So we have selected a specific town where people are from and I am targeting the diabetic patient from that town. I'm thinking of an in intervention that we are going to give our patients and I believe a nut-based diet, which is uh, healthy and it can help reduce diabetes. This is completely hypothetical. I don't know if it is or it is not. I'm just putting it down as a foot for, uh, as an example. And you can follow this uh, thought process when you are doing your own research or trying to formulate your own research questions. So my intervention is a nut based diet. Comparison. For comparison, I'm selecting diabetic patients from another town, town B. And my outcome is the reduction in blood sugar. Reduction in blood sugar. So now let's move on to the research question. As you can see, I have written down a question. Does the introduction of nut-based diet in diabetic patients in town A reduce their blood sugar compared to diabetic patients in town B on regular diet? If you know, I have. if you can see, I have color coded my research question also P co in the underneath it. So nut-based diet is my intervention. Diabetic patients in town A are my target population. O is the reduction in their blood sugar. C is the compression group. So do you think this is a proper um, research question? You can rephrase it in various ways and you can phrase it in whichever you will like. And hopefully following this example, if you address these four points, you'll be able to write down a good research question. Now, I had a, a group activity planned for everyone. So where we would be split into groups and we'll be doing a group activity, but um, due to technical difficulties, we don't have a uh, we don't have a breakout room available today, but I don't think we have that many participants present. Um, Nobin, how many participants do we have? We currently have 37, so yeah, including you. All right. So if all the participants agree, then we can do something. We can uh, skip the groups, take 15 to 20 minutes, do some simple exercise, think of a target population, Think of an exposure or intervention, select a comparison group for that idea, and then write down your identity, then identify the outcome 
you want to research in and then write down the research question. What we'll do is I'll give you overall um as it we don't have a group we'll I'll give you 20 minutes to do this. You can use Google or any other type of uh, literature or journals or books you want to do use. You can use that. Any type of references you want to use, you can use. And after you have, after 20 minutes have passed and everyone has written down 20, uh, their own research questions, uh, we'll take turns and we'll go through the research questions. I'll ask you to write down your research questions and your PICO in the mass, uh, message chat. And then we'll go one by one and if I'll expect um, discussion on that from everyone if, if you think it is appropriate or if you think it's not and how can it be better uh are you on point does everyone agree with that then i'll stop sharing my screen and if anyone has any questions you can ask uh, i'll probably be around or you can ask in the chat let's start um first of all um let me ask did anyone face any sort of difficulties when trying to do PICO? Whether it's E or I, I already saw that Tatenda had a question which I answered. Uh, was my answer sufficient, Tatenda, uh, or do you want do me to want me to? No, yes, it it was sufficient. I think the I think there's sometimes difficulty in terms of you doing those that kind of research in terms of okay if you're assessing the management surgical capacity or something like that um there's an assessment there's a question about what the outcome actually is for sure um so usually when we do research um the rule of thumb is that we will do something like um let me start presenting then that will be easier for everyone i guess just give me one minute um For example, every research has an outcome. Uh, uh, for example, recently my uh, research group, we are doing an intervention, uh, sorry, evaluation study. Have you guys heard of evaluation study? Do you know what evaluation study is? Right. Basically, evaluation study is um, when you are asked to evaluate a currently ongoing research or a project that's been ongoing, to evaluate if the research, uh, research or the project that's ongoing is actually making any difference or has the money gone to waste. So for example, in Bangladesh, uh, there are quite a few projects going on, both governmental or an NGO or internationally funded. So these organizations are over, over organizations worldwide, for example, WHO, NHS, they do periodic evaluation of their work. The, the, sort, uh, the types of various activities they're undertaking and they evaluate if the activity they undertook has been effective or has it not. So that is an evaluation study. In that evaluation study, you go in, you assess the evaluation put in, intervention put into place and you assess if the things have shifted for a better. So the outcome of that study is whatever you are looking into, basically you are trying to evaluate, yes, thus, yes, the study or the project has cost, has contributed quite a lot into the improvement of the life of the people living in this area, or it has not significantly attributed to uh, any contribution, uh, sorry, it has not significantly contributed to the uh, improvement of the livelihood of the area. So that's also an outcome. So whatever you're looking into can be an outcome. So if I'm uh, speaking in a broader sense, usually I we use the term exposure or intervention. I see everyone used intervention because it is easier to un understand. Exposure is a bit difficult. Because those who have done observational study or have read observational study is usually the exposure. For example, in the example given by Tatenda, she uh, she is talking about um does uh, sorry um just give me where is that yeah 
how many diabetic emergencies are managed in a one year period at a district versus tertiary level hospital in a single province? So her question is, if we break it down, first of all, her uh, target population can be two different things. Her target population is, I am guessing, uh, district level hospital or target area is district level hospital. So people receiving the, uh, diabetic emergencies there and the uh, comparison is the tar tertiary level hospital. So it does not necessarily have to be people or population. It's just a mnemonic for our better understanding. It can be anything. So she's talking about system, district level hospital versus tertiary level, tertiary level hospital. Then her exposure is diabetic emergencies managed. And her outcome is the number of diabetic emergencies managed. So she's looking into the num uh, she's saying that diabetic emergencies have happened in both district and tertiary level hospital. She knows that. Now she wants to know how many were uh, handled by each facility so that she can, for example, she's trying to do facility assessment to see which facility is doing better service for this kind of medical emergencies or something like that. So it can vary. And then um, uh, Gan Ching, I'm a bit confused about your outcome because to me, after reading your question or research question, it seemed like the outcome is actually um, the improvement in clinical outcome. So you are looking into the overall betterment of clinical outcome in compared to sutured or sutureless, right? So it's not really safety and efficacy because you're talking about gastrochysis, which is sutured, which is sutureless. So these are the two things. So you're actually looking into safety and efficacy of maybe sutureless gastrochysis not overall gastrochysis. Did it make sense? Uh, Raymond, your question was, does administration of prophylactic antibiotics uh, reduce pre-perioperative mortality rate in patients with open fracture compared to those who do not receive prophylactic antibiotics? So um, uh, you have right, wrote down that patients with open... Um, so uh, your target population is actually patients with open fracture who are receiving prophylactic antibiotic, not just any patient with pro, uh, open fracture, because you are comparing with those who have not received profil prophylactic antibiotics, but those people also have open fractures. So you need to have a clear demarcation there. And then, uh, and uh, your intervention is at administration of the prophylactic antibiotic, and then, outcome is obviously um, the mortality rate, perioperative mortality rate. The question overall was good. Then Salomia asked, um, please correct me if, you am, if I am pronouncing on them incorrectly. Among patients with early stage rheumatoid arthritis, thus taking supplements of vitamin D and omega-3 versus having a normal diet without those supplements reduce the progression of the disease. Um, so I am assuming you are doing a clinical trial where you are having a you are a, you have a group of early stage rheumatoid, rheumatoid two groups of early stage rheumatoid arthritis patients. You are giving vitamin D and omega three to one group, and you are giving normal diet to other group, and then you are looking if the uh, progression of the disease is reduced being reduced due to the intervention. Am I right? Yes. All right. Then what is the efficacy of lifestyle intervention programs like increased physical exercise and dietary changes on blood pressure control in hypertensive patients residing in urban and rural areas? So someone is looking into intervention. I for I is lifestyle intervention. And then the um, comparison. Um, Nabil, can you differentiate the a target population and the comparison comparison group you are thinking about in this case. The target is our target is our one, right? Um, in your case, the question I understood, but the problem with that is, um, when you say urban and rural areas, I am thinking it is 
between in both areas. So you need to clearly differentiate between the two groups. For example, you can say that um, uh, what is the it, uh, what is the effect of lifestyle intervention programs like increased physical exercise, exercise and dietary changes on blood pressure control in hypertensive residing in urban areas compared to those living in rural areas. So it is better understood, right? As it is, it is a bit difficult to understand what your research question exactly is. So remember the uh, and or between compared to, these are very important in research questions. So you need to be very mindful of how you use it. Because research, research question needs to be clear cut for your own sake, also the research team sake, also anyone with whom you are trying to communicate the research. Because if you don't know the exact things, uh, no need to call me, sir. I am, you can call me by my name, or if you're from the South uh, Asian continent, you can call me Bhai or brother. All right. Um, Aparna Venkatesan, in patients with solid brain tumors, what is the effect of stem cell mediated therapies when compared to traditional chemotherapeutic routes? Um, does anyone from the crowd, um, apart from Aparna, wants to volunteer and critique this question? Anyone, feel free, or I will uh, randomly ask someone. Um, I think it would help to have um, maybe kind of like a target hospital or a target region um, in terms of where of these patients, um, as well as like, is it gonna be, is it kind of like a systematic review of a certain amount of years? Is this kind of like a prospective thing? Is it a trial? Like what, I think we just need a bit more information, I think. Exactly, specifics matter. When you're trying to do a research, you need to like, you need to address a gap or a certain question. Otherwise, why are you doing research? For example, um, the Nabil is talking about uh, the lifestyle intervention between urban and rural areas. Maybe he has found that uh, in rural areas, people are doing, uh, in urban areas, people are not exercising enough and that's why they are having more hypertension. So that's why he's looking into like, if he can incorporate those things into the urban areas, that might help. It would have been even better if he actually identified, for example, which country or which city. That way, it would have been more, uh, it would have been better because that way you can actually say uh, the time plus person of the research because for example the blood pressure rate in bangladesh hypertension rate in bangladesh is not same in india it is not the same as in uk or is not the same as in somewhere in americas you can actually go there and then you can look into it and you will see that for example in western countries um Actually, my the reference that I'm using is quite, uh, I think it, it was from a year back, but you can actually see that in urban areas, the hypertension and these non-communicable disease rate is actually going down because in Western countries, the people living in these urban areas are getting more aware. They're living a healthier life. They're going to gyms. They are using uh, parks. They are having a healthier diet using avocado. They are going into vegan they're avoiding various sorts of uh, fast foods and unhealthy foods. That's why the urban, in the urban areas, the people are actually having a better life. And compared to that, the rural or the people who are less uh, doing, are, who are, sorry, people who are less well off are actually relying on fast food, fast food more because they don't have enough time to buy groceries and cook foods or they don't have enough money to buy foods regularly. So what they do is they uh, buy healthy foods regularly. So what they do is they go for cheap fast foods and they don't have the time to exercise. So the research question and uh, dimensions change according to the demographics. So you have to be careful of that as well. 
For example, in my question, if you look at it, I'm talking about town A and town B. So I am actually narrowing it down. Um, I have quite a few more questions. Um, I will just briefly go through two of them and see how they are among elderly patients with severe pneumonia, does vitamin C administration decrease their length of stay in the hospital? All right, makes sense. You're having two groups of elderly patients, but it would have been nicer to have the patient demographics. Does the medical therapy combined with lifestyle modification in young patients as 25 to 50 with a 50% internal carotid artery symptomatic stenosis have better outcomes than fewer risk? compared to young patients with 50% internal carotid, carotid artery symptomatic stenosis who undergo open surgery. All right. You are, little, you are doing a cross-sectional study, I'm assuming. Uh, Marishiara, Mar Mar I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, you are saying that the intervention is medical treatment and lifestyle modification. So, but I'm seeing that the younger group of people are also going, uh, going undergoing open surgery. So they are having the medication as well. So you're, oh, uh, all right, I understand. The lifestyle modification is the intervention, got it. How does the average wound healing time in type one diabetic patient versus vary as compared to type two diabetic patients in, yeah, all right. You're doing a cross-sectional study. Your exposure is wound healing time. You're doing, you're looking, comparing between type one and type two diabetes and the outcome is, yeah, all right, looks good. So I'll now briefly go through how to do a proposal development. It will be very brief because proposal development actually comes at the end of the proposal. When you have done, you have already written down your research question, your research objectives, your study design, your target populations, research methodology, and everything else. But as those will be covered in the following sessions, I am just doing a brief overview and so that you can keep in mind this is the cyclical or linear process that we follow in research. For example, uh, first of all, background following review. For any proposal that you are writing, you need to do a literature research and you have to write a background because you have to justify the need for that research. So how do you write that? After a general overview of the topic, what context is your focus? For example, P from your PICO. Then you have to summarize the current evidence at your disposal and write the literature review. Then think of it. Uh, then you have to put that literature review and write down in a background so that if you are presenting it to someone, for example, me or supervisor or a stakeholder or a funder, can actually, or a donor, you can actually show them and they can quickly read your background and say, all right, I understand this is why the, this research is needed. So you have to identify all the things that I already mentioned earlier. Um, what is that, what is, why is this research needed? What is the current evidence? For, what are the gaps in current evidence and which gaps are you trying to address? And how you are trying to address them? This is very important. And after that, it is the aim and research question that we already did. Research question is the PICO, we, the question we wrote down using PICO. And after that is the aim. Aim or hypothesis is the answer to the research question, which I did not talk about earlier, but I'll just briefly talk about now. So basically, for example, the question I am looking at right now is Pierina Pereira. Her question is, how does the average wound healing time in type 1 diabetic patients vary? So, Pierina, when you came up with this question, did you already have a something like, have an idea in mind that maybe, yeah, I think type 1 diabetic patients will have a quick, quicker wound healing time compared to the type 2 diabetic patients or vice versa? Otherwise, you would not have gone to look into the difference between them. 
So you already have a hypothesis or you think the wound healing time is completely same. So your, for example, if I think your hypothesis is that the wound healing time is same in both diabetic, both types of diabetes. So your hypothesis will be that the average, the average wound healing time in type 1 and type 2 diabetes patients is exactly same. So your null hypothesis, which is that actually you say that it, this is a research term, you say that whatever your hypothesis is, the negative of that or opposite of that is the null hypothesis and usually that is always present. And you are doing research to prove that whatever you're doing is actually not the norm. So null hypothesis will be that there's actually a difference between the two wound healing times or vice versa, depending on the evidence or literature, it will be the wound healing time is actually different. So you're trying to find that out, but null hypothesis will be the difference is actually same or there's no difference. Then objectives, which will be taught to you later, each research proposal or research study has to have at least one or even it, some can have more objectives. Then appropriate study design with justification. You have to do, you have to select a, an appropriate study design that meets your study. For example, if you're doing uh, interventional study or observational study or which type of interventional study or which type of observational study. For example, there are cross-sectional, there are cohort, there's case control, et cetera. Or, or on the other hand, there is a randomized control trial, non-randomized control trial, simple randomized control trial, cluster randomized control trial, so many different types of research. So you need to justify why, why, why are you choosing that type of study design and why is it appropriate for your research. Then you have to go stakeholder engagement. Why, the, why is it important? You cannot do research by yourself. You have to go to donor to ask for funds. You have to reach out to stakeholder or people who are actually working in that field and talk to them and see the study that you have come up with is actually relevant because if the people who are working in the field or who are experts in this field think that this is not relevant or this is not addressing any research gaps, then you have to go back to the drawing board and come up with a better proposal or better study design because people who are working or who are the experts in this field usually know from their previous experience which is good and which is wrong. Then after you have done the stakeholder engagement, you have talked to them, then you decide the study methodology. What is study methodology in this? It will also be discussed in the later sessions. You will talk about target population, the various variables, how the study will actually take place, how you are going to do the data collection from where, when, how the randomization will take place, all of this. Some of this will maybe go over your heads and you will not understand because these are academic jargons and without proper pre prior experience or proper explanation you might not understand so in this study methodology you usually write down how you are going to do the study and what is actually going to take place you write that down step by step in a uh, in a uniform manner then potential impact of findings after everything you need to write down what is the potential impact of the findings that you are trying to find because if your research, the research topic you're working on does not have any potential impact or it, it is not doing anything, then why are you uh, investing your time, your supervisor's time, your entire team's time, as well as money and funds into this research? So you need to justify that to your supervisor, to yourself, to your team, as well as donors and other stakeholders that yes, this is the impact that I'm looking to have, and this is the potential there, and this is why it is needed. All of this is needed. all of this has to be included in the proposal. Last but not least, you have to include some things called budget, timelines, ethical approval, and other requirements as part the requirement of the 
team you are going for or as per the institutional requirement or even the institutional review board or the donor that you are going to get funds from so they might require some other things for example some in some for example for example in my organization they have they ask for cvs of the all the is uh, all the members in the research team we have to provide cvs we have to provide that we have the ethical clearance to do research so it varies from organization to organization but these are the miscellaneous things that you need to prepare now on to my last topic i'm sorry i think i am going a bit overboard if that if that is all right then i'll take 10 minutes more or if it is uh, cutting it cutting a bit too close then i'll just briefly go through what do you suggest what will be feasible for you because we will have another 10 15 minutes of question answer session in the end yeah. So, yeah, that's okay. so, sorry can you repeat sorry can you repeat yes it's okay you can continue all right so now we're talking about creating a proposal timeline so for example this comes after you have done everything so you have completed this cycle you have completed this cycle now you are ready you know what you are doing when you are doing it what how you are doing it you know everything now you are trying to create a timeline for your sake and for everyone involved with the study so first step in creating a timeline is identifying milestones so the milestones what are these these are the key deliverables or outcomes that you need to achieve such as literature review data collection analysis writing submission etc you can use a template or checklist to guide you through the common steps of a research project or customize your own based on your specific topic and methodology you should definitely consult your supervisor donor institution or any other for any uh, specific requirements or deadlines that you need to follow the research sure has to follow deadlines you cannot do research without deadlines because people are giving you money and you have timelines you have to meet that timelines if you cannot meet timelines then you'll be in big trouble then estimate the time required estimating the amount of time needed to complete each milestone of a research project can be difficult due to uncertainties and contingencies to make your estimate more realistic and accurate you can break down each milestone into smaller tasks use your past experience or similar projects as a reference or you can even seek help from your supervisor your donor or your research team and draw uh, and if you're a new uh, beginner researcher you can actually take their help and draw into that pool of experience and create your timeline also you have to add buffer time for unexpected issues revisions consider your availability and the other commitments and be realistic and honest with yourself and others then choose tools what does tools mean in creating and managing a research proposal timeline is to choose the tools that best suit your preference and needs. Gantt chart, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it. It is a tool which is a very popular, uh, which is usually provide, which usually provide a visual representation of the project timeline, showing the start and end dates, dependencies and progress of each task and milestone software like Microsoft Project Excel or online tools like Trello or Asana can be used to create and update Gantt charts. Calendar, calendars are also useful tool for marking deadlines, appointments, and reminders. You can do it digitally or do it uh, manually on paper. You can sync it with your email or phones, or you can share it with your supervisors. Then there are apps, I think, or tools called Todoist, to-do lists, and there are various types of uh, uh, other apps tools such as evernote or google keep which can be used to keep and maintain a timeline then review and adjust as i was talking about this in the estimate uh, time required segment is that nothing is certain 
So everything is variable. For example, you are going out to collect data, but the school has closed down or there has been some sort of emergency in that area, for example, earthquake or something else. So you cannot go to do, go to do data collection. So your study will be delayed or some, for example, you have fallen sick or something else has happened, or maybe one of the, uh, some sort of emergency has happened, for example, COVID, which put the entire world at halt for two to three years, something like that has happened. So you have to be flexible about that. So you have to review and adjust your research proposal timeline regularly. This is important as research projects often evolve and change over time due to new found findings, feedback, or challenges. You should monitor your timeline and compare with your actual fund performance and identify any gaps, delay, or risks. And you should also communicate with your supervisor, team members, stakeholders, and regularly update them on your status, achievements, or issues. If necessary, you should revise your timeline and make adjustments to your scope, methods, or resources to ensure you can complete your project on time. For example, for today's session, we are planning on doing it through breakout room, the group activity. But as the group, uh, breakout room was not available, we did it in a different manner. We had to adapt. So we have to be flexible about that as well. And you have to review and adjust. For example, in, in, in a few seconds, I'm going to show you an uh, example gun chart that I am currently using for my project. You will see um, that is not ideal. There are quite a lot of faults in that one. And I had to go through, I actually review it every week and update it accordingly. All right. So here is a uh, draft project timeline that is I am currently using for my project. Um, I It will look a bit glitchy or there will be some steps missing because I had to remove some steps because such a, it is quite a big gun chart and I can, I could not um, put it, fit it into Microsoft PowerPoint slides. And that's why I had to remove a few rows also for the anonymity and the uh, sanctity of my project. I had to re remove a few crucial details so that I did not convey any important information that was not supposed to be conveyed with outsiders as of yet. You can see um, there's a, a mistake in the Gantt chart you'll see is that August 2022 to July 2022. So it would have been January 2023, January 23. This was supposed to be 2023, but the, this was a typing mistake. So the project ran from August 2022 to July 2023. In that time, we kept two months for protocol development or proposal development, two months for staff recruitment, three months for protocol approval by IRB, Institutional Review Board. We had three months for baseline assessment. At the same time, you will see that we had simultaneously other things going on. For example, preliminary field visit, study school selection. Uh, we are formulating and finalizing our materials. We are developing contents. We are developing a mobile app. Also, we are doing, after everything is done uh, by February, we are doing the data analysis and report dissemination based on the baseline assessment that we did. And after that, we are pro promoting and advocating with other stakeholders and government. So this is a timeline that we are tentatively following for my current one of my current projects. So this is a grand chart. So on the description end, we have I have actually our team has broken down the various timelines and milestones, and we have selected or allocated months. So you can actually do it quite a few ways. You can do it weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, like here, or you can even do quarterly. So three months at a time. It depends on the length of the project or the type of work you're doing. With that. Uh, thank you for bearing with me and listening to my presentation and hopefully it was a fruitful one. If you have any questions, please ask. And also I will give my email to Nobin. You can reach out to me in any 
confusion in case of any confusion or if you need help with something else or you just want to discuss ideas you can ask me questions uh, by uh, unmuting yourself or you can actually uh, put the comment in the messages uh, nobin how do you want to moderate Okay, yes. so yeah, I actually already started uh, with a question I had personally and would also ask others uh, to actually uh, provide questions which you feel like asking. You can actually do it yourself in the chat box or if you want to ask directly, you can raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. So yes, here you can, if, yeah. Well, for the first um, question, it's my question personally, right, which perfect. is, uh, I'll read it out to you. Uh, will the other supervisors feel boosted if we proceed with all of them together and then choose one of them later? Like, how can we tackle such a situation? Like, if some of them, like, suppose uh, they one of them feel boosted right now, but I might need them in later part. So, how will I tackle such a situation? Um, so, first of all, it is actually a very good question. I also actually mentioned that in the slides that. It, this is a common courtesy that you can actually do this that um but you have to be open and direct with your supervisors that you are approaching and have to tell them that yes i am approaching you but i am at the same time i'm also asking my other options as well so this is quite normal because to be honest and to be frank you're not the only one who's reaching out to your supervisors or that's that specific supervisor. Trust me, that supervisor, if it is for PhD or something else, that supervisor is getting emails on a daily basis from multitudes of students. In that case, it is it actually goes both ways. So they all they as they are all themselves talking to multiple students at the same time, they usually do not mind if you're talking to others as well. For example, I know for I know of quite a few people who actually applied to seven or eight PhD programs at the same time. They got selected into four, they interviewed into four, they got offers from three, and they then chose one, but they informed the other three that, I'm sorry, I found a better offer. And I think that other supervisor is better suited for my needs. Um, I, so I'll be continuing with them. So it is very normal and common practice. Okay. Thank you so much for your answer. So we have another question from Tatenda. Um, uh, uh, no, no, before okay. that, I have yes. another question. Someone messaged me directly. No, sure, sure, sure. So I'll be answering that. Uh, someone is asking is who will be involved in the stakeholder? Um, it is actually up to you because uh, I'm not sure if you know how to do a stakeholder engagement. That is uh, before doing any research or doing any sort of activities, we have to do a stakeholder engagement and find out in your area or on that topic, who are the people who are actually working and who are the experts. So you have to do a, a stakeholder mapping. There are, I think it's a four, uh, four by four grid where it, you, you have like most interested, most influential, least interested, least influ influential or something like that. Um, just give me a minute and I'll see if I can find a Google image for your uh, understanding. In the meantime, people, if you have any other questions, you can please write in the chat box. We'll be taking questions afterwards. Not too many, but we will be trying to address all the questions if you have any. So if you still have any other questions, uh, please, please, please write down in the chat box. So if you see, I just searched in Google using um, stakeholder mapping metrics, and there are so many metrics and so many different types of formats. Like, for example, this is the four by four table I was talking about keep satisfied, monitor, manage, post, and keep informed. So it's a two hour long session by itself. Uh, but if you are interested, do look it up, and it is quite easy to understand. And if needed, maybe in future you can arrange a session on that as well but yes to understand who are your stakeholders you need to do stakeholder mapping regarding that subject it is essential uh yes no next question 
Thank you so much for the answer. So for the next question from Tadanda, we have, how do you approach a situation in which a supervisor promises a certain level of involvement, but under delivers or show less and less interest in later parts? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not saying this is an ideal world and I have not seen this happen. Uh, I myself have not suffered from this particular, uh, uh, this specifically, but I have seen my friends and colleagues suffer from it. And there are quite a few ways to uh, encounter that. One is to be persistent and persevere, which means that keep on egging them, keep on messaging them, keep on communicating with them that this is my timeline, I need this for this, or you have to strict uh, set strict guidelines or deadlines from the beginning of the term. And at the end of the day, even, if, even after that, they did not, if, even after that, they do not um, reach out to you. You can always reach out to that department or higher ups of that supervisor in case of emergencies that I am not unable to communicate with them and I need them. And this is the thing that he or she promised in email or in writing, but he is not following through right now. And that is why I'm being delayed. So. It is always better to have a written agreement that way everyone is accountable. But if it is verbal, you can always um, tell them that it is not working out and you can look for other supervisors if, it, if you are not too far in already. I have seen that happen. I've seen people change their PhD supervisors after two years of their PhD because they, did, they were not getting along with their supervisors or they were not getting what they were promised. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we'll be taking a last question if there is any. Uh, if anyone has any other questions before we end today's session, uh, please, 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 please write down in the chat box. We'll be taking last question if there is any. In the meantime, okay, um, I don't. Yes, go on. In the meantime, uh, if you, if any of you have any sort of feedback or suggestions for me to be a better, how to be a better facilitator or where to improve, uh, you can write down in the chat box or you can tell me. I'll wait four minutes after from now, so maybe till uh, three. Uh, with what will that be? So I'll be waiting four minutes more four more minutes and if and if you have any suggestions or uh, tips for me you can type directly in the chats or you can directly message them to me or you can say out loud thank you um let me know what to do yes, thank you so much um so i don't see any other questions here so uh I think we can actually, uh, if you have any feedbacks for Dr. Sanvir, you can actually say it out now, or you can personally inbox him, or you can also email Tatanda or uh, through the, you know, you got your link through the email, so you can just reply there and we'll be sending the feedback to Dr. Tanvir for all of you, on behalf of everyone. And we will be actually, you all should know by now that we will be having a series of sessions and you need to attend uh, at least five of them, uh, like 75% of them to actually get your certificates. And this is the first of the series of uh, sessions that we'll be taking. So each month we'll be having at least one session. So those of you who have attended today, please, please, please try to understand that this is really important for all of you to attend the rest of the sessions as well. Uh, if you have any problems, that's fine, but uh, you need to at least attend 75% of the sessions to get your certificates. So uh, if we don't have any other questions or if no other feedbacks is there, uh, Tatanda, uh, do you want to say anything before we end? Uh, no, nothing else for me. Um, I will be sending a post workshop survey. So please look out for that. And yeah, we'll, you'll get more updates from our team as the weeks go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatanda. And thank you so much, Dr. Tanvir Hadar for actually joining today and giving us such a wonderful presentation. It was really enlightening for every one of us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.